I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. As it approaches its first anniversary and its second budget, the Albanese government is discovering one of the toughest challenges is saying no. On JobSeeker, a growing list of Labor MPs are publicly backing an increase. There's pressure too for more to be spent on health and affordable housing. On the NDIS, the Prime Minister is worried about the rate of spending growth and he wants to rein it in, prompting immediate concern from disability advocates. And then there's defence. Australia's military is being reshaped to meet a more dangerous outlook. But the government's trying to hold the line on spending. No new funds are being tipped in just yet. And guess what? That too has upset the critics. The Defence Minister Richard Miles responds to those criticisms. He's my guest this morning. But first, here's the panel. Peter Harcher, Amy Ramikas and Andrew Green. This is a very busy government right now. Lots of reviewing and reforming uh, going on. I want to start with the Defence Strategic Review. Peter, what did this one tell us that we didn't already know? Well, the two big strategic observations that this Defence Strategic Review makes are things which a first-year student of international security at any university course could tell you. Right. And that is, one, the US is no longer the unipolar dominant power of the region. OK, we knew that. Two, uh, that China is running the biggest and most ambitious military build-up uh, since World War II. Thank you very much. But With a lack of transparency. It with a, with a complete lack of transparency or explanation or justification strategically for why it needs the world's biggest navy and so on. But um, the really striking uh, conclusion that this Defence Strategic Review puts in black and white, officially endorsed, is that Australia's military is not fully fit for purpose. That's a direct mm -hmm. quote, not fully fit for purpose. So we've been paying and continue to pay $48 billion a year for a military which this review says is not fit for purpose. Now, if your military is not fit for purpose, that means when, you know, when it's time to fight, they're, going, they're not going to win. This is a huge admission from a government. Um, it, it really is striking. And then, but then the rest of the, the, rest of the document um, adds some detail but really leaves hanging most of the questions about what the government intends to do, about what they say is the need for, go back to, to go back to fundamentals for the first time in 80 years. Well, there are some answers there, and without going through line by line what's in the review, Andrew, the basic thrust of it is um, we need to move away from things like infantry fighting vehicles and get a lot more missiles. Yeah, the idea is to be able to hold potential adversaries at bay at a longer distance, and that all makes sense. We're a maritime nation. Mm. We have our trade routes, our maritime approaches. That's all very sensible. But as Peter points out, we've known a lot of this stuff for a long time. Uh, we had a defence document put out under the Morrison government that made very similar findings. Not a whole lot new in terms of the strategic outlook, but perhaps what you get is the sense of urgency and the fact that the government realises that the time frame and the key point of this three-year time frame that's now included in the latest mm. thing, that's particularly alarming. What are those things that could happen in the next three years? We might find out from the Minister uh, in, in a moment, but, Amy, if the threat is, you know, or the, or the danger is potentially within three years, if defence is not fit for purpose, uh, it's all pretty scary stuff. Is it surprising there wasn't additional money in, in the response to it this week? No, and I think that's pretty telling about, like, you know, how scary it's supposed to be. There is not an extra dollar being spent on this in the next four years. It's just repurposed defence spending. Mm. Yes, it's all coming due in the next ten years, and yes, that will be when the problems are. But I probably uh, would have some disagreements on the panel, but I don't think that it is an imminent threat. I don't think that Australia is in imminent danger of war, if at ever. We have used our defence force mostly for... Uh, helping out with natural disasters in the last 10 years, so it's not exactly surprising that they're not fit for purpose. I think that it is reasonable to have a review and say this is what we need to do, but I think the review was already, like, of it was foreseen. AUKUS is the big thing that happened before the review. The review was just there to tell people this is why we're doing it, get people on board, but when all of this was being announced, we're still talking about job seekers, so I'm not mm. sure that the Australian public is really on board with the defence. And we'll come, to, we'll come to job seeker, but do you think... Uh, well, I guess there's two, two points there. Either the threat's not real uh, or uh, as, as serious as, um, as, as it being presented, or is the government under so much pressure with its budget that it's not willing to put the, the money in to, 
if the, support this. If the threat was as real as, as has been made out, mm. then the government would be putting in all of the money now. And that's not to say that there isn't a threat and that's not to say that there is not a case for, you know, cementing our place in the region. But if the threat was that, yes, this is going to happen in the next five years, we would be battening down the hatches and we're not. Yeah, what do you think, Peter? About which bit? Well, <laughs> the, 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 if the threat is basically, Amy, suggesting not as real as is presented in this mm. review and by various other experts, that's why they're not pouring more money in right now. Well, they claim that they can cover the essential needs by cancelling existing programs. They've told us a couple of army-based uh, you know, hardware programs. There's got to be some cuts to the Navy. They've foreshadowed that. They've said, because we're now going to buy these nuclear-powered submarines, we can cut some of the... They, they use the word reconfigure. Cut some of the surface fleet. But that's going to be subject to a new review. Um, the other review is a review of strategy. This is called a defence strategic review, review, and yet it doesn't include a defence strategy, which Richard Miles tells us is now going to be subject to a separate review to report next year. Which, again, it's, it's an interesting disconnect here, and not, not on the funding point, but this, this is on the urgency point. This report talks a great deal about the extreme urgency of the situation, and Richard Miles himself has said there is no time to waste. Mm. And yet, coming out of this review, we still don't have a defence strategy. You know, who are, we who are we fighting, where and how, is not in this review. It's going to be in the next review. So there's a curious mismatch, this leisurely pace of next phase of reviewing with the stated urgency of the problem. Well, we're review there's a few reviews that come out of this review, uh, including into the Navy surface fleet, uh, including into making missiles in Australia and, and so on. And, Andrew, as you've been reporting, um, there is at least one retired US admiral being called upon to uh, conduct the Navy uh, review. Are we leaning too heavily on the, the, the former American generals and admirals? This is a fear that a lot of people in defence have. Now, we have to point out up front that these American admirals are extremely well qualified. They lead the most powerful Navy on Earth. Uh, these are the people you would want to seek advice from, particularly if Australia's objective is to be interoperable with that Navy or even interchangeable is the new language. But the problem is uh, we keep probably going back to the same experts and are we expecting new answers from these same experts? Some of these prob problems have been around for a long time and we've been getting that advice from the same people. Well, I can tell you the former Defence Minister, Christopher Pine, doesn't seem to have a problem with uh, relying on these former US admirals. He had a bit of a go at you, uh, Andrew. Yeah. I can't understand what the big deal is. Um, when I saw that story, much as I like Andrew Green, and I do, I thought, so what? I mean, honestly, uh, $5,000 a day US is less than almost any barrister operating in the Sydney bar, uh, and I think it's a great big beat-up. $5,000 a day. Well, it clearly shows that Chump business change. is good in, uh, in the lobbying world. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the wrong game, clearly. <laughs> I'm trying to hold them to account. <laughs> but coming back to, I guess, Amy's point, what underpins this whole conversation? How, how serious is the threat? How real is, is the threat? Um, does this still need to be articulated better by government? So the document, yeah, the national defence document, makes the point that the risk of invasion is remote. There is... That is... Invasion on the Australian of, mainland. Of the Australian mainland. But what we're seeing already is the evidence of that grey zone activity. Very close to Australia in the Philippines in the past few days, those clashes between Coast Guard vessels and Chinese flag vessels. That's, that's the threat that we see articulated in this report. And that's what is at the front of mind for the government as well. Well, uh, time to talk to the Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister Richard Miles. To take us there, he was the Shadow Minister, Andrew Hastie, expressing concern about the Army's capability being eroded. The government has promised a lot with this DSR, um, but what we're seeing is, is no new money. We're seeing cost shifting and we're seeing cannibalisation of Army capability. If our strategic circumstances are as challenging as the government says they are, and we think they are, well, then we, we haven't a day to lose. And so we need speed, we need urgency and we need delivery. Richard Miles, welcome to the program. 
Thanks, David. Good to be here. So the Defence Strategic Review says we can no longer rely on a 10-year warning period for any conflict. Uh, it says defence planning needs to focus on a three-year period. What risks do we face in the next three years? Well, <clears throat> David, I think the risks that we are facing around the world right now uh, is a global rules-based order, which is under as much threat or stress as it's been at any point. We obviously see that in Ukraine, <clears throat> but we also see it uh, in our own region, in, in places like the South China Sea. Um, this is being accompanied by the biggest conventional military build-up that the world has seen since the end of the Second World War. That obviously has an implication for our strategic landscape. Um, but we've also changed. Uh, you know, we are much more reliant upon our economic connection with the world. Uh, you know, in the early 1990s, uh, our uh, trade as a percentage of our GDP was around 32 per cent. It's now, in 2020, it was up to 45 per cent. And there's a physical dimension to that economic connection. Most of our liquid fuels now, almost all, come from overseas. Back in the 90s, we used to do it all onshore. In fact, most comes now from just one country, and that's Singapore. So the, the threat is not that we're about to be invaded, but our exposure to economic coercion and, and to coercion from uh, an adversary is greater, and the potential for that coercion going forward is much more significant. And that's where the threat lies, and that's why we need to reposture for that. Threat. So, in the next three years, the worry is our trade routes, our fuel supplies could be blocked by China. Well, it, 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 at first, it's not just the three years. I, I, it is that, but I think it's 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 beyond that. So, we are thinking about this over the next three, the next, next ten years, and beyond. But the point that we're really making is that when you look at the way in which great power contest is playing out, and particularly in our region, you look at that uh, military build-up and you look at our exposure to that through our, a much greater economic connection to the world, uh, we are much more vulnerable to coercion uh, than we've ever been before. And we need to be thinking about the way in which we posture our defence force to deal with that. And, and what that means is we need a defence force which has a much greater power or ability to engage in projection because so much of what we need to do is beyond our shores. So to have a defence force with the capacity for impactful projection across the full spectrum of proportionate response is now what we are seeking to achieve. And that's really, the, as I said, the first retasking of our defence force in 35 years and we're now seeking to put in place as quickly as we can uh, the equipment which, which postures mm. us for that. Well, given what you've just said there about needing to do all this as quickly as you can, and given the review says defence is not fit for purpose, why aren't you increasing defence spending over the next four years? Well, we're repurposing $7.8 billion worth of expenditure. That's not tweaking or, or fiddling on the edges. That's a, that's a significant amount of money. Um, we announced that there would be six priorities that we would pursue in response to the Defence Strategic Review, and we believe that we can do that with that $7.8 billion, which means that in total, over the course of the next four years, we'll spend $19 billion on our response to the Defence Strategic Review. But no new money review. is the point, no additional funds to deal with you know, this threat that you're talking about. But this is an exercise of reshaping our defence force. I mean, the very notion of that is that there are some capabilities that we need more of, like long-range strike missiles. Uh, there are some capabilities we don't need as much of going forward. And, and what are those? Just, sorry, just quickly to... on that. We, uh, we know the, the reduction in the number of infantry fighting vehicles. Are there any programs being cut? Well, we, we've, we've uh, mentioned in infantry fighting vehicles. We've actually put out a, a long list of projects that we will not be uh, proceeding with. And that what, was what are some of those? Just, just give us week. one or two examples. Well, a, 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 a number of cut. those go... Well, well they're, 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 there's a lot in there, but a lot of them go to various uh, base upgrades which were being planned over mm. the next few years. But and any so equipment? We've had a, Is any, an any actual military equipment being cut? Any projects? 
well, well, we, well, we put the two critical ones out there, um, which are the, the self-propelled howitzers and the second tranche right. of them, um, and the infantry fighting vehicles. And I've listened to the, the, you know, the commentary about the infantry fighting vehicles. Uh, I mean, the point here is that we need to be thinking about projection. We need to be thinking about how we can have a more nimble defence force which can operate beyond our shores. We don't have... Um, the, the transport craft which would enable the 450 planned inventory fighting vehicles to leave our shores. Um, and so unless you're talking about an invasion of Australia, uh, the, the vast bulk of those numbers would have been stranded here. And, and that's ex an exact example of why we need to be thinking about what is the threat, what do we need to have a defence force for, thinking about from first principles and working out how we prioritise. And we're doing a lot of prioritisation in terms of that, and we're doing that over the next four years. Over the decade, we, we are saying that there's going to need to be more money. And, and let me be clear about that. There is more money in the four years. In mm -hmm. Defence funding was planned to grow by the former government. We accepted that. We committed to that but you're not this going time that. last year. And that, commit, and that commitment is being met. But beyond that trajectory, we see that there will be a need for greater expenditure even, even beyond okay, that. But, but right now, I mean, the, the, the review is very clear. It says, and I quote, defence funding should be increased to meet our strategic circumstances. Where does it say that that should not happen now? Well, we, we accept that recommendation. We but you're believe not that we can meet now. the... We, we are... Uh, funding is increasing over the next four years in, in line with what had been projected. Been We've repurposed $7.8 billion worth of expenditure and we are increasing uh, defence expenditure over the decade and beyond. OK. But and, and that meets the recommendation that was made by the Defence Strategic Review. Does the classified version say you've got to increase funding now? No, the classified version is, is in, of this recommendation is the same as what's in the public domain and, uh, and, and we, we're confident that we're meeting that in word and spirit. OK, on missiles, um, is Australia going to buy Tomahawk cruise missiles? It's, that was a little unclear in this report. Uh, the, the, the focus is not on that in, in the immediate term and, and in terms of how we have responded to this with and long range strike missiles is, again is one of the, the other six priorities. What, what the war in Ukraine has shown is that the, the stocks of uh, long range missiles amongst our friends and allies is just not what we would want. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to go out there right now and procure long-range mm. missiles, and we need more of them. But on Tomahawks, uh, I mean, so the US gave what, the green light about a month ago, didn't it, for Australia to buy them? There was much excitement in the government. So are we not buying them just yet? Uh, well, again, well, that, that's a question that we will um, consider and pursue right now in terms of the response that we have made. Uh, that's not what we are focusing on, but we are why focusing not? Why, on why making not? Why sure... Not? Uh, these are, you know, very, they, these are long-range missiles. Yeah, because it's the, the priority of what we need to do uh, is to get what uh, stocks we can get right now and to get into the manufacture of long-range missiles so that we well, that's going can to have a while what we well. will need Sorry, just forward. on the Tomahawks, though, I mean, are you saying... Um, I'm just a little unclear as to why you're not buying them now if the US says you can buy them. Is it because you don't have the, the funding agreement from your Cabinet colleagues to spend some more money? Well, it's not that, David. It's the, it, it is the, the priority uh, is where we've placed the priority, which is right now um, buying more of the HIMARS system and getting into the purchase of uh, Precision Strike as well as getting into, the, into manufacturing so that we can have uh, the, the stocks of those missiles. And that is the focus right now. I mean, Tomahawk is something that we will consider over uh, the, the journey. But right now, the, what we need uh, is to get war stocks up mm -hmm. in relation to... Uh, and platforms in relation to high Mars and war stocks up in relation to them. And so, that, that okay. is what we are pursuing. So as far as making missiles here, there'll be another review into exactly how this will work. Just tell us what you envisage here. Is Australia going to make um, the entire missile or just the, the rocket motor or different parts of it? Will we, and, and, and on what scale will this provide all the missiles we need? 
Well, well firstly, there's, there's, again, I hear all the commentary about reviews. What we've been really clear about is the processes that government goes through in the ordinary course. There's not reviews here. You know, we're making a decision right now and we're committing money right now in the budget in nine days' time so that we can get into manufacture in a realistic way. I mean, the former government left very little money to actually do manufacturing of guided weapons and they had a time frame of not beginning manufacturing okay. of so guided what, what you, weapons what, what until 2027. Now? We, we, well, we, we, are, we have taken that commitment from $1 billion over the forwards mm -hmm. to 2.5, a more than doubling right now. And what that will mean uh, is that we are uh, confident that we can see the beginnings of manufacturing in the next couple of years. Uh, and, and ultimately, our ambition is to establish uh, a production line with uh, companies in this country which would provide for the manufacture of those long-range uh, missiles and, and doing as much of that as, as possible. Um, in you know, the next couple of years, we hope that we can begin with the assembly of the strike missiles that go in the HIMARS system, um, but we want to build on that so that we're actually uh, manufacturing these, uh, the, the full suite of these weapons in Australia. And could we see separate facilities for separate companies, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, each have a production facility in Australia? Well, we're, we're speaking with both of those companies and, and we're hopeful that we can, we can get to that and not just those two. We're talking with Kongsberg as well, which is based with the out government, of Norway. Would the government own part of the facilities or would these be foreign-owned missile production facilities? Well, again, we'll work through that in, in, in terms of uh, what the answer to that looks like, but we will obviously be investing in it because we need to get to a point where we can get this manufacturing capability in Australia. And, and, and to be clear about the point of it, uh, we're not going to get the war stocks of these uh, over the journey unless we're manufacturing in Australia. That's really the lesson that's come out of Ukraine, that the industrial base in the United States and amongst our friends alone uh, is not going to satisfy the kind of war stocks that we will need in the future. Right. And so if we want them, we have to be involved in manufacture in Australia. So it is about purchasing what we can right now from overseas. Um, and we do believe that we will get a potent capability in a relatively short period of right. time, not the whole capability, but over the next couple of years um, in terms of these longer range strike missiles. A again, to put this in some context, David, right now we can throw ordnance about 40 miles. Um, this will have us being in a position of being able to, in the next couple of years, uh, project more than 300 kilometres, and that's, that's a, a, a massive step change. On the Navy, uh, so a further review, albeit a quick one, to look at the surface fleet and, and what sort of ships we need. Why, why couldn't the Defence Strategic Review provide some answers on this? Well, I mean, if we, I mean, to be honest, the Defence Strategic Review made some observations, but I can understand this. I mean, they were considering a lot of issues over a short period of time, and what they've said here is a pretty big part of really defence, though. I mean, they've made very detailed. You know, these are the vehicles Army should have. These are the missiles, but they they couldn't touch the Navy. Well, they did touch the Navy, um, and they made a couple of really important observations about the Navy, but the point they then made precisely because of the tenor of your question, which is uh, our surface fleet next to the submarines is the biggest platforms mm. that we have, it really did deserve uh, some a, a short review, but a, but a period of time where we are thinking just about that. Okay. And, and, and I think that that's not unreasonable in terms of, of, of bandwidth here. I mean, the two observations that it makes in relation to our surface fleet is, is firstly that the current structure of our surface fleet was imagined when we were purchasing a diesel electric powered submarine. Now we are going to be acquiring a nuclear powered submarine capability. They asked the question, does that have an implication in relation to the shape of our surface fleet? Yeah. And the second observation they make is that modern navies are going down the path of having a larger number of smaller vessels. Well, just so on what that, does so, that yeah, mean? where does that leave the frigates? I think the, the work on the first of the fr new frigates is meant to start uh, next week. Should they pause for a bit while this review is underway? No, and, and we're not pausing on that. And okay. In fact, work on, on Hunter has been uh, underway for quite a while. Um, and, and we're a fair way down the track in relation to Hunter. And, and that's an important observation that you've just made because we're not starting from scratch here. We, we inherit the world as we found it mm. when we you were just might not get elected many. back in May. But, but 
the, the, but the current structure of our surface fleet build goes not just over the next couple of years, it goes over the next few decades. Right. It's, it's thinking about what we're building in the late 2030s into the 2040s. And so in that context, you know, we've got the time, not a lot of time, but mm. we do have the time to think just about what our surface fleet should look like. And uh, we're going to take that time. And I get that there's going to be the criticism that we've seen over the, the last mm. week. I'm happy to wear that criticism okay. if what it means is we get the right answer to these just questions. Just a couple of quick will. ones. Just a couple of quick ones, if I can, Minister. Ukraine. Is Australia going to continue supporting Ukraine with military supplies? Yeah, we are. And, you know, the, Ukraine... Uh, well, the resistance in Ukraine has been completely uh, inspirational and, and hero heroic as, 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 as the Ukrainian Defence Forces have been defending their own country. But they have been really defending something more than that because when Russia crossed into Ukraine, it was a complete breach of the UN Charter. And so in many respects, the fight in Ukraine is also a defence of the global rules-based order, and that engages Australia's national interests. So what, what further support we're very will, proud will to you be... provide? Well, I think the answer to that question is that we're very proud to be one of the largest non-NATO contributors to Ukraine. Um, Not we the are largest punching anymore, well though. above our weight. Not the well, largest non-NATO well contributor. Our well, they want the Hawkeye vehicles uh, but, in particular, but, but, a few other things. Are the Hawkeye vehicles, it, why, why can't they be sent? Well, I'm not about to speculate on specific platforms, but if I can just finish that, that question uh, or that answer, David, I mean, we are one of the largest non-NATO contributors. We intend to com continue to be that. Okay. Uh, and we're working really closely with the Ukrainian government about how we can best make a contribution, knowing that this is going to be a protracted conflict and we need to be there with Ukraine for the duration. And so we will continue to do that and we will work with them about how that contribution can be best provided. Um, and, and yes, that's a, a kind of high-level principled answer. It's not specific, but you can look at our record right. since coming to office in May and you can see that, you know, that, that in principled statement has been backed up by action just, and it will continue to be so. Just finally, on the situation in Sudan, Australians wanting to leave were told to try and get on that final evacuation flight uh, last night, our time. Do you know how many Australians made it and how many uh, didn't? Well, an additional 17 Australians overnight um, have been evacuated from Sudan, and that takes the total to 155. And we've been working very closely with our um, like-minded countries and friends to provide opportunities for uh, those who want to leave Sudan to do so. And there have been seats available on those flights. Uh, th that's not the end of the options. Uh, there are still options out of Port Sudan, which is on the Red Sea, which is, um, I think it's about mm. 800 kilometres from uh, Khartoum, but there are opportunities there going forward to for people to leave Sudan in what is obviously a deteriorating, deteriorating situation. Is that on a British Navy ship or something? Um, and, oh, well, there are ferries there and, right. and there may be other options coming out of that. I mean, the important thing is, is this. Australians in Sudan, and there, are, there do remain a number of Australians in Sudan, really need to make sure that they register. We will continue to work with friends and, and allies and do everything within our power to provide options for Australians who want to leave to leave uh, because we understand how difficult yeah. this situation is now. All right, Deputy Prime Minister, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thanks, David. All right, let's get back to our panel. We're joined once again by Peter Harcher, Amy Ramikis and Andrew Green. Just quickly to pick up on what we heard there, um, I found the, the, the missiles uh, conversation interesting uh, there, Andrew. The, the tomahawks, there, there was a fair bit of buzz around that a month or so ago, but now it's a bit unclear whether yeah. that's the missile we still want. That's right. Well, certainly not the priority. Uh, interesting to hear him say that precision strike being manufactured locally is a priority. That is going to be very difficult. We've already seen how slow this process has been. When the former government talked about getting these weapons, it took them two years to down-select two companies, uh, to work out that there are two companies. I mean, it's painstakingly slow to date. Mm. And to give credit to Richard Miles, he is trying to speed that up. Yeah, and it sounds like he's open to having multiple missile manufacturing plants in Australia. Yeah. This could be bigger than perhaps uh, first um, thought. We'll see. Let's turn to the budget, though, because you know defence isn't the only call on the budget. As we know, there's an increasing call uh, to spend more on job seeker, And that call is coming from the Labor backbench now as well. What I'm looking for is a rise in job seeker rate and in income support um, as, a, as a bare minimum. We've been waiting for this for 
well over a decade um, and I think it's really important that we actually enable people to live dignified, meaningful lives. Amy, what, you can tell us how many Labor MPs are now publicly calling for job seeker to be increased in the budget and why are they now um, making this case? So there's about 14 or 15 who have come out publicly. Mary Doyle, the new MP for Aston, has joined the list of MPs. She's not even sworn into the she hasn't, Parliament she hasn't yet. Even sat She's in come Parliament straight yet. out of the blocks. Yep. Um, Cassandra Fernando, the new MP for Holt, has also written to the Prime Minister saying, I know what it's like to be a young migrant coming to this country. You have no chance for employment. You're trying to settle uh, your life down. You need help. And that is what this has come down to. It has been more than two decades before we have seriously looked at what we are asking people on income support to live on. There was a doubling during the pandemic which showed how easy it is to lift people out of poverty. Why are they all coming out of the blocks now? Labor was elected on a platform of no one left behind, mm. but we have seen no movement on this. We were hearing about tinkering. We're hearing about, oh, maybe we can do this or maybe we can do that. Uh, we're going to look at it when we can. People are living in poverty now and it is a gendered issue. More than 60% of people on income support, the low income support payments, are women. Uh, the sole parent, you are most likely to be a woman. You're also most likely to be looking after a child with disabilities. Uh, you are also on mutual obligations from the time your child is six mm. if you are a single parent and you cannot find a house to rent, you cannot get a room to rent, you cannot pay for food food, you cannot pay for medications and there is no help for you. And, and all of these new MPs are younger, they are more in touch with their communities I think because they haven't necessarily gone through the same political school that a lot of our other MPs have come. Some are worried about the green threat, yes, but there are a lot of people who have actually seen what we are doing to people and saying enough and if the government doesn't respond they're going to pay the consequences for this. This is not something that's going away. Yeah, I mean it, it's interesting cross-section of MPs when you look at the group that are speaking out. They, they do, as you point, represent, um, point out, represent both inner city and outer metro seats. They're not particularly factionally one way or another. It's, it's quite a cross-section. Um, now, presumably the members of the Expenditure Review Committee, the, the, the budget raiser gang that make these decisions, Peter, they're, they're well aware of the, the arguments here that living on $50 a day when you've got to do all the things that Amy lists there, you know, food, transport, your rent, your medicine, your... All of that is, is incredibly difficult to live a dignified life, as Labor likes to say on, on that. Um, it's impossible. So they, they're aware of that, mm. but they're, they're, what are they weighing here? Is it the inflation concern that if you put too much into Job Seeker or to the economy generally that you're going to make the inflation problem worse? Is that the, the issue? Uh, well, there's a couple of overriding themes here, I think, David. Um, and it's not just Labor MPs. Remember that even John Howard's on the record calling for an increase mm. in job seeker. It's such an obvious need mm. uh, and, and is widely perceived to be such. Um, so I suspect there will be some uh, increase in welfare payments. Social, uh, social policy has to be a critical element of the makeup of a Labor government, obviously. No one left behind. No one left slogan. behind, yeah. says the Prime Minister again and again. So I suspect they will address some of that, but it will be modest. This is a government that's determined uh, to govern from the centre and to cement itself uh, occupying the centre so broadly, so firmly that it blocks the, blocks the sun from shining on the Greens on the one hand and the, and the Coalition on the other. So um, but the it wants to demonstrate... The shifted. The centre isn't necessarily where Labor thinks the centre is anymore. I think they're, they're prosecuting old arguments that were going through in the 90s about what people thought about income support. Well, we they haven't, haven't caught up. We haven't seen the budget yet, so it's a week and a half and we'll see what, what arguments they are prosecuting. It suits them at the moment and it reinforces Albanese's confidence that he is positioning in the centre. The fact that he's got Adam Bant on the left saying the government's never going far enough on almost anything and on the right he's got Peter Dutton saying the government's going too far on almost everything. Yes, David, to answer your question, the government uh, has to make sure that whatever it does in this budget in a macro way uh, doesn't add any fiscal impetus to inflation because if it generates more inflation through uh, 
extra impulse, the fiscal impulse, then it's just going to be an invitation to the Reserve Bank well, two things. to put up rates. And can I just add a final bit? It's got to demonstrate that it can do the whole job with fiscal responsibility if it wants to inherit the mantle of being fiscally responsible. Yeah, and in inflation, uh, you know, as they'll point out to you, hits the poor more than the, the wealthy, right? Inflation really hurts those on the lowest income. So they don't want to do anything that pushes up inflation. They don't want to be blamed for anything that pushes up inflation, right? Because, Andrew, if, if interest rates were to keep going up after the budget and they'd you know, done something, you can, you can bet that's where Peter Dutton would go. Um, but right now, this is, a, this is a, a tricky one for them. They've, Amy's right. They've got to do something. They know that. They're not going to go as far as is being suggested here, though. No, and it's a diabolical and difficult situation for centre-left governments around the world. They are all facing this same pressure coming out of the pandemic. A lot of uh, budgets are massively in the red, but mm. there is this need to be doing something, to be seen to be doing something and living up to the promises that were made before the election. Now, where we will see movement most likely is on the single parenting payment. Uh, it's pretty clear through the ERC process that it's landing somewhere. Uh, it was at 16 before John Howard This is where it. you lose the payment once your child, uh, at the moment, your youngest child turns eight, you lose the single parenting payment. If you're a single parent, you go back on the, the lower job seeker rate. But they're going to lift that to something. It, it seems maybe. around the 14 mark, somewhere above 12. And again, that speaks to the Prime Minister's uh, own childhood situation and he would be wanting to, to act on that. Well, in fact, he's been wanting to act on this for a while. Anthony Albanese, about 10 years ago on Insiders, he was battling um, Bill Shorten at the time for the, for the Labor leadership and he uh, admitted the mistake of the former Labor government uh, when it came to the single parenting payment. The uh, sole parent payments is an area where we made a mistake. We essentially meant that some of the most vulnerable people uh, ended up with less income, but perhaps uh, just as importantly to them, uh, to those that I've spoken to, there was a lack of respect, I think, for the role that they play as, uh, as single parents and a great deal of disappointment. Labor must always be the party of the disadvantaged. Labor must always be the party of the disadvantaged. He makes a pretty strong case there. Yeah, eh? he does. But uh, to go to Andrew's point, if they do change the threshold for the youngest child for single parents to 14, that helps 50,000 people get an extra $100 a week. There are about 1.4 million people who are on the low <coughs> income support payments. Job seeker, youth Job... allowance. And... Yep, so that doesn't do a lot for them. We already know that if you're on the single parent payment, you are living in poverty, as you are if you're on Job Seeker. So there needs to be be a holistic look at this. And the Prime Minister does like to talk about his lived experience, uh, and it is important, but the reality is, is that if his mother was going through the system today, she most likely would not have access to public housing. She most likely wouldn't even be on the disability support pension because rheumatoid arthritis isn't considered you being disabled enough. You still have to go through mutual obligations. And the stark reality for so many women over the age of 55, if they do not own their home, is that they will be living in their car or homeless without family support. So yes, while he talks about his lived experience, he's not giving the same chances to people who are experiencing that now. When you talk about the, the holistic, the need for a holistic response to this, I mean, all of these things we're talking about this morning and so often are about need to spend more here, need to spend more here. It, it does raise this question about, you know, revenue. We have a revenue problem. Mm -hmm. Would it have more punch if some of these Labor MPs saying, got to increase job seekers, said, and here's how you do it. You know, you've got to rein in stage three tax cuts. None of them seem willing to go there. No, because uh, the Labor Party knows that that would be an invitation to be smashed uh, by the coalition, and they're scrupulously avoiding. Uh, because remember, they Is went. That the next step here? But they went into this. They went into this term. Say... They went into this term saying they weren't going to increase any taxes. Mm. So uh, what they've set themselves up for, and I think what they are now setting themselves up for, is uh, to create, uh, to, to look at that side of the revenue, at uh, the revenue side of the budget for the next term of Parliament. That is, right. for Albanese to go to the next election saying, OK, you've seen me for three years, um, I've tried to win your trust to get some credibility, and now I'm going to ask you for permission from the electorate mm -hmm. to look at a thoroughgoing tax review and here's what we have in mind. That's the way he seeks to get... He will seek to get political permission. 
uh, without being seen to be breaking election commitments. He did announce after the National Cabinet meeting on Friday uh, some funding that will be in the budget for housing, $2 billion, $2.2 billion for um, Medicare or improving uh, primary care. Uh, we'll see more detail about that, presumably, uh, on budget night. But then he also announced on the NDIS, um, well, he, he said very plainly that the funding growth, the trajectory that it's on, is unsustainable. He was pretty strong on that. He pointed out, rightly, that this is a critical scheme uh, for people living with a disability. This you know, has absolutely changed lives. It, it must continue. Uh, but he then announced that he wants to put an 8% cap on that growth in, in spending by mid-2026, here he was. We are trying though uh, to recognise uh, with an 8% an target by the end of the forward estimates and then uh, putting it on a, a, a further uh, sustainable uh, trajectory to make sure that this scheme can continue to deliver, that we don't find ourselves in a situation down the track where the viability of what is a critical scheme for Australia is drawn into question. And that did not go down too well with the disability uh, organisations in the sector who point out they're still in the midst of um, negotiating with the government and cooperating in a review process. When it comes to you know, you know, creating that fear for community that your funding is going to be cut, like we have every right to feel that right now. We've got an NDIS review coming up. Um, you know, they're trying to be, rebuild trust with the community uh, and, and work in that collaborative space, you know, bringing people in to find out what is working and what's not working. And, and we haven't had that review drop yet. Um, so it seems a little cart before the horse to, to you know, make these announcements um, today ahead of, of seeing what that review actually states. Yeah, was it a bit cart before the horse to drop that figure out there? Well, I think it caught a lot of people, even in government, in, by surprise. There was no mention of it by the NDIS minister in his National Press Club address. Only a week or so ago. That's right. And, you know, the, the point is the Prime Minister is saying this is now growing at 14% each yeah. year and uh, this is about reining that growth to 8%. Still grows. But... Still grows, but that means that the minister will be having to look for saves somewhere. Yeah, well, the estimations are that we're talking about $60 billion that would save if you drop that growth rate down to down to 8%. Um, so the detail of what that looks like in terms of impact on the scheme... Uh, well, it's with... not money we're talking about, it's people. Exactly. It's people who are going to be cut off from the scheme or not have access or to Or equipment the that they can or access. Or equipment changing. or how much their budgets will be allowed. And it's just... I think we are increasingly reaching a point where we are looking at where Australia is spending money and there seems to be a bottomless pit mm. for defence, and which is great for the military industrial complex. There is a bottomless pit when it comes to tax cuts. We're willingly foregoing $250 billion. The budget will update what that figure is. I expect it will be more um, over the next 10 years in revenue. But we're saying to people on income support, we can't afford to do anything for you now because that's going to be inflationary, which is something that's been rejected by economists like Chris Richardson and Danielle Woods, who say that they're so low, they would just be paying their bills. They're not going to go rushing out on a spending spree. They might just actually be able to match living costs. And now we're saying to people on the NDIS, oh, sorry, we're not sure if we can take care of you either. And and I completely take Peter's point, but then you have to wonder, when do we start to get governments with political courage to do what is needed when it's needed, rather than worrying what the political yeah. landscape looks Just like? Just on, on the NDIS, I, th I think they are being pretty sensitive to say, you know, we're not about cutting people off the scheme who are currently on the scheme. We don't want to frighten people this morning. They're not saying mm. that. No. Um, they, they're they're uh, trying yeah. to find ways to get that growth rate down. Albanese's pitch is, this is a vital system we need to preserve. The current growth rate, an annual increase in spending of 14% uh, on an infinite trajectory would, would destroy the scheme. Um, if you project that as far ahead as you project the submarine, the nuclear-powered submarine, you get to $2 trillion uh, by 2050. So he's simply saying we need to reduce the trajectory of growth from 14% to 8%. The criticism, and it's a valid one, is that he's launched that onto the community without explaining how that will be achieved. 
So that will create a lot of worry by creating uncertainty, mm. and they need to address that. They do. Let's turn over to the migration review. A lot going on as we flag at the start, but this was announced by, uh, well, the, the, the outcome of the review and the changes now to the migration system announced by Claire O'Neill, the Home Affairs Minister at the Press Club during the week. Um, look, the, the review led by the, the former uh, top public servant, Martin Parkinson, I mean, it finds the system's a mess. It's broken. It's just a spaghetti bowl of different visa classes and it's just not working in our interests we're you know not really attracting the 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 high skilled there's a global race for those high skilled workers we're not getting them we're ending up with too many um, foreign workers going into relatively low skill low pay they're vulnerable as a result so look um it's it and then a lot of the problem too is the international students that yes some coming in legitimately to study but some just coming in basically to work um what's the prescription here to to, to fix it amy uh, I think Claire O'Neill laid out what the prescription is, which is a complete just scrap it and try and start again to, to fix this. And that means looking at the jobs that are on there, setting like thresholds for income so that you're bringing in uh, skilled migrants who actually are going to address skill shortages rather than just bringing in people and then, you know, putting them into like hospitality or other jobs where they're more at risk of being exploited as well, um, which we've seen. Hopefully it will mean that you'll get more people People coming through for the care industry, which is desperately needed. Well, but they're talking about a new, um, from what I understand, their intention is to set up a new care visa um, for those in aged care, which would be first cab off the rank here, to, to try and address that shortage because their incomes are going to be lower than that new 70,000 minimum salary they're setting for, for, for skilled foreign workers. But the other part of it, which Claire O'Neill and this review have also identified, is that there needs to be easier paths to permanency because what are we actually offering people who come to Australia? Yeah, yeah. And if you take something like the care industry and where we draw a lot of workers from, um, such as uh, Pacific Island nations, caring is a lot of part of their culture. They care for family members. It's not necessarily a labour. Mm. You care as an industry. So it's not even a transferable skill. We need their skills, but we're not giving them anything and, to then, you know, say look, you can stay here. Business unions, they're all pretty supportive of what the ministers uh, announced here. Um, the debate very quickly, Peter, went to population, though. The opposition saying this is a big Australia by stealth plan. Claire O'Neill saying, no, it's not. It's not about big Australia. Yeah. Why is this such a hot button issue right now? OK, so... The, the problem that, that the government suddenly found itself with was that at the same time as they're talking about this new system for the immigration system, uh, the projection for this year's uh, mm. increase in population, thanks to immigration, came out with a huge number. 400,000. And another Four, 315 next year. So but very explainable because yes, yeah. this is people returning after the pandemic. So, yeah, it's so this is a catch-up yeah. uh, of people who are kept out coming in. And then it goes down again. And then it goes down. Uh, the government is saying that it will revert to something around the long-term average of about 200,000 in a year or two. Yep. Uh, but it suits the opposition to conflate the two and say, no, no, it's the government. The government's new policy yep. is going to create this huge influx. Mm -hmm. In fact, Claire O'Neill, the minister, tells us that if her new system is implemented in full, it would actually, over time, slightly reduce the net yeah, overall by, by, intake. by tightening up the international student intake, tightening up the, the uh, skilled worker yeah. intake. Look, just quickly, because we're running out of time, the wedding yesterday. Oh. <laughs> uh, we've got a picture of it here. The Prime Minister went along to the, uh, the wedding of Kyle Sandlands, uh, Sydney Radio uh, host and you know someone who has said plenty of offensive things over the years but someone that the Prime Minister quite likes and has a big big audience uh, and an audience of people who aren't necessarily you know politically locked in one way or another just quickly what does everyone think I think I, I, I think Albanese took what could have been a, a sow's ear and turned it into a silk purse by saying I stick with my commitments this bloke is a working class kid made good like me uh, and he can get away with this because he's got an unimpeachable personal integrity story. Uh, Amy? Ridiculous. It was just ridiculous. I think this was probably the worst <laughs> week for the Albanese government since <laughs> they were elected. Yeah, right, right. And I won't be that harsh. I think there were no photos with John Ibrahim, so he dodged <laughs> that's, bullets. That's the baby's so to speak. fine. Yeah, the baby's yeah, fine. Yeah, this is advance that's worked over time. Yeah. This is also a million people that listen to the program. Not only are they potential votes, they're just not engaged in politics yeah, exactly. at all. So that's a win. Our panel, Peter Harcher, Amy Ramikas and Andrew Green, will be back shortly with some final observations. Time now, though, for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures.
I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with comedian and host of TV programs, the one and only Alex Lee, and a very warm welcome. Thanks, Mike. And you've got a new program. We do, yes. It's called What the FAQ, and we're taking questions from anyone about literally anything, and we're going to try and answer them. Alex, this week the government got um, uh, on the offensive about everything defensive when it released the Defence Strategic Review, and um, Brett Lethbridge seems to think it's a bit of a wake-up call. And Interesting timing though, right before Anzac Day. That's right, yeah, and he's tied that in beautifully there. Yeah. Bit of a blast there. Bit of a blast on the, there. On the bugle. I do like his uh, his elbow. It's unique to Brett Lethbridge, but it's definitely elbow, you yeah, know, that square yeah. head. Bit of a lest we regret, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful David Rowe, missile diplomacy, oh, and there's more where that came from, right, Jimbo? <laughs> I just love the look on Jim's face. Like, yeah, he's struggling with his poker face. The little teeny missiles, it's all in, right? That's mm, right, yeah. but you know, it's not the size of the missile that counts. No, right? well, that's right. It's uh, how you use the how you use the missile. <laughs> Peter Brolman seems to think that all the new gear is going to be made by the person who bids the least. <laughs> it's now lest we <laughs> lest tender. Lest we tender, yeah. Would, would be comforting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And down in the trenches of Gallipoli there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Over the top. <laughs> what are your legs? Long range missile launches. <laughs> how are you going to launch them? Fast. <laughs> Alex, it's not only the cost of living problem, it's the cost of finding somewhere to live. I grew up poor in a humble council house raised by a single mother on a disability pension. Luxury. Yeah, it's the yeah. old uh, Monty Python stuff, isn't it? <laughs> he says it so much, I think he should put it on a hat like Trump. I did love this Fiona Kataskis. Nursery rhymes for our times, isn't it? There was an old woman who until recently lived in a shoe. Sorry, kids, but this is all we can afford. Yeah, she paid so much rent she didn't know what to do. Uh, living in a thong and all the people sort of lined up for the uh, the house shoe. Yeah, and the poor old lady next door living in a crock. <laughs> Terrible leakage <laughs> when the rain comes. <laughs> Beautiful Matt Golding. The changing uh, nature of what kids want. You know, it used to be when I grew up I want to be an astronaut and now it's... When I grow up I want to be able to afford a roof over my head. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's heartbreaking. Beautiful uh, Wilcox. Let's play house. I'll be the cashed up mum and dad investor and uh, you can go live in the car. This generation will be the only ones who grow up playing apartment because they won't know what houses are. <laughs> It's a bit of a blast from the past, Alex, with the uh, um, US election over a, uh, a year away. Taking us back to a time no one wants to go back yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, let's get ready to mumble. <laughs> <laughs> You've got this, Joe. Psst, Joe, wake up. He seems to be on uh, intravenous here or That's something. That's right, and he's, yeah. he's forgotten his tooth. I mean, people are worried about having a toothless president, but <laughs> literally this time. You know you're a confident cartoonist when you can hide such a great line as this here. Me, Me the, the people. people. <laughs> Just hide it away as a little Easter egg. It's so good. Here we've got Biden 2024. I'm off and running with the uh, the Zimmer frame here or the <laughs> yeah. walking frame. Yeah. He's not running for president. He's wheeling for president. There. <laughs> Alex, it's been a great pleasure unpicking the events this week and uh, I'm looking forward to your new show. Thank you. Back to you, David. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Mike. Let's get some final observations, Andrew. There's a draft exposure bill for multinational tax transparency. It's upset weapons companies because under the current draft, they'd have to declare all their assets in Australia and overseas publicly. Obvious national security implications. They don't like doing that, I'm sure. Amy? The Tasmanian uh, stadium announcement is going to have yeah. further ramifications, particularly in the middle of this housing crisis, which Tasmania is feeling acutely. And I think housing is radicalising more people than the government is aware of, and they really need to get on top of that. Yeah. Peter? A taste of things to come with artificial intelligence. The moment Joe Biden announced his next run for president, the Republican Party released an ad entirely generated by artificial intelligence depicting a fictitious dystopian America and horrible scenes on the streets. I think we can expect more of that. Uh, where, where are we going with our uh, elections? Thank you all very much uh, for joining us this morning. Finally, Anthony Albanese, or DJ Albo to his friends. He's expected to visit the White House later this year. He might need to work on his karaoke, though, after this impressive effort from the South Korean president. We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. We know this is uh, one of your favourite songs, American Pie. American Pie, guys. We went and did you sing it. <laughs> A long, long time ago. Yeah. I can still remember how the music used to make me smile. <laughs> Well, boundaries will go bright. Wow. Something touched me deep inside. The day wow. the music died. Wow.
making us all feel very excited about being here.